way, one thing that we, our, our markets, can, uh, can really improve is especially the other side. I think we are, we are doing uh, better and better on the retail investor front, but the institutional side really needs to pick up the pension funds, the, um, the, the index funds, and, and so forth. And now we are ready for our first panel, very close to my heart, uh, the IPO panel. Um, where is Irmantas Norkus, partner of Cobalt, uh, who will be uh, moderating this uh, panel? Irmantas, if you are here, are you here? Great. Um, do you think um, the, the, the fact that the two years, two years have been relatively quiet, yes. you know, in the IPO front, maybe it's a good thing? But now uh, law firms, advisors and companies have time to prepare. Absolutely. Two years is nothing compared to 20, right? <laughs> and uh, as a, my first IPO experience, I remember year 2000. And that was uh, perhaps the first Baltic true international uh, public offering. And that was uh, Letovos Telecomos. And it was really a big big uh, thing uh, for our markets uh, because uh, the size of the offering was uh, in excess of 1 billion liters at that time, close to $300 million. Uh, the company was advised by UBS. A team of international advisors were lining up. And I remember uh, myself uh, dreaming about being a part of that uh, process. And to me, that was uh, kind of a dream job. And uh, the process and, and, and the offering went uh, successful, and I thought, okay, now I will become a capital markets lawyer. That's my dream, and this is uh, what I'm going to be. But guess what? I had to wait uh, for 20 years <laughs> until the next landmark uh, IPO happened, and that was Ignitis in, in uh, 2020. So, you know, 20 years compared to two years, uh, so two years is nothing. Right. And, and uh, my, my point is here that, uh, you know, uh, uh, to me, uh, Baltic capital markets or IPO markets, it's like uh, two chapters and two stories. One uh, was 20 years ago, and that was uh, kind of first attempt really to go public with a big size, good company offering and to attract uh, foreign investors. But that was more an exception. Now. 20 years later, with Ignitis, Enefit, uh, Port of Talent, and uh, another company uh, considering IPOs, that's another story. That's another chapter of uh, Baltic market development. So, two years to wait, uh, nothing. All right, Before have a good open. panel. Yes, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you. And, uh, dear audience, thank you for, for this opportunity to be on stage and, and uh, to, to start our first uh, panel discussion. And uh, let me invite my fellow panelists to the stage. And I will start with uh, Irakli Mtibilishvili. Irakli is a managing director of Citi. For the last eight years, uh, he has been the chairman of Citi's banking and advisory business in Central, Eastern Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Irakli, please join me on stage. Hello. Good morning, uh, uh, please uh, clockwise. And uh, also Michael uh, Torim. Michael, please uh, join us. Michael is the head of investment uh, banking L LHV, which uh, I, I'm sure you know very well. LHV is very active on capital markets in the Baltics. And uh, Michael uh, was uh, part of, of a number, multiple teams advising uh, regional IPOs in, in the Baltics. Thank you, Michael. I would like uh, also to, to uh, invite uh, Yuri Sadamovic. Uh, Yuri is a founder and chairman of uh, APF Holdings, holding APF Holdings company, who is uh, starting his uh, its offering uh, already from tomorrow. Yuri, very welcome to the stage. Also, uh, my great pleasure to invite Marty Talgre. Marty is the managing director of Infortar IS, uh, leading or perhaps the largest investment company in Estonia, acting in, in uh, fields of shipping, energy, and real estate. Uh, Marty, please join us. 
And uh, uh, I'm very happy to have a representative of Air Baltic, our uh, carrier champion in, in, in uh, the Baltic markets. Paul Salitis, uh, he's a chief uh, operation officer and executive uh, board member. <laughs> Paul started as a pilot and uh, grew up into, uh, into executive board member and chief operation officer. And he is now focused on very much on uh, uh, out or incoming uh, public offering of Air Baltic. So, dear friends. We have limited time, it's 45 minutes for our discussion and five minutes for questions. So uh, let me start uh, and shoot the first uh, uh, more global uh, question to Irakli. So uh, Irakli, if you could uh, give us a brief uh, overview of, of what has happened in, in uh, IPO markets uh, globally uh, recently. Yes, hi. Hi, Amantas. Hi, fellow um, co-panelists. Hello, everybody. I think we have a couple of slides um, uh, that, that, that I've asked to put, put out there. Um, but before I do this, um, I'd like, if, with your permission, I'd like to make two or three somewhat unrelated comments as we watch unspeakable things that are happening in Israel, um, our support, our thoughts, and our um, sympathy goes to the people of Israel. Second is going to be very short, very much, you know, on my, on my mind always. Slava to, Uk to, to, to Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Um, and the third one, because this is a Baltic Capital Markets Conference, um, I, you know, an, an observation uh, from me that I might offer you from you know, approximately 30 years of being in professional services um, based, broadly speaking, in the region and having worked with many governments around a lot of important issues on privatization, capital markets, etc., etc. As I listened today to Mr. Kalmish and his, his comments, I think for the first time I hear from, from a politician, you know, call spade a spade and say very openly um, what the issue is, which is a you know, it's amazing that 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, societies of the post-Soviet Union countries continue to be gripped by this fear of letting go, right? Uh, um, just interesting to put things in perspective. 30 years, and we're still in this uh, uh, amazing paradigm that holds us all back um, in our development. So, Mr. Kalmich, thank you very much for the comments you made. At least they, they were honest. With that, um, if I may, um, so look, it's been, um, it's been a tough year, right, um, uh, globally for, uh, from a point of view of uh, uh, international capital markets. And if we can um, move um, to the next slide, that will, is there? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, why do we say it's been a tough year? You, you know, this graph shows you, um, and, and uh, this is a little bit dated um, in terms of, this is by, um, you know, in the first half of, um, um, of this year, but you can see what happened to the volumes, right? We, we as bankers, you know, think about this in terms of volumes, and, and the graph is very, very telling, both globally and also closer to home, which is what, a region we call EMEA. Um, uh, it, it is fair to say that uh, there's been a massive collapse um, in terms of volumes. Uh, now, it looks massive mathematically, um, but I think a couple of observations. 2021 has been an amazing year, right? Um, and therefore, um, it is very um, um, uh, off a very, very high benchmark that we, that we think about. But when you think about more normalized years, averages of you know, 2015 to 19, um, sort of five pre-COVID years, I think it doesn't look that bad. But also, and very importantly, um, as you can see, um, particularly as far as EMEA is concerned, we've seen you know, this year has been better year um, uh, uh, for, uh, for the, uh, for the um, equity capital markets uh, compared to last year. Last year, we've had um, um, a lot of external shocks. Um, and, um, but at the same time, as we're very focused on the topic of you know, primary IPOs um, or IPOs in general, 
IPOs um, have actually suffered even further com so far compared to last year. Now, this number you see, 12 billion across EMEA, EMEA being you know, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, is a dated number. Um, since then, we had uh, an IPO of the ARM, which was 5 billion, and a number of other IPOs uh, by European issuers, um, by the way, dominated by um, listings in the US. European companies or global companies with European headquarters and heritage um, doing a lot in the US uh, because the US, particularly in the growth space and the tech space, continues to dominate, um, go, to, go to the US. Um, uh, so this number is, is, is um, now closer to 20, so very, very much what, we, um, you know, what we've seen last year. And, and, and it's going down. Now, why is that? Well, we'll you know, I, I think there's so much written that, that you know, whatever my comments are gonna be, that, you know, I'm gonna offer you things that you probably already know, but, but um, for the sake of clarity. Um, IPOs are very sensitive points in time for the markets and for the issues. Um, I think it's very important to know because um, this is a new company, untested, um, the markets and investors don't know who the you know, management are, how good they are, um, how credible they are, et cetera, et cetera. And the biggest fear of an investor is that the share price tanks after, after the company comes out, right? Um, and, then, and then there needs to be a context um, of um, macro certainty, uh, openness to taking more risk, and we had everything but that. Um, uh, during, during this year. And the biggest issue has been, um, uh, obviously, the, the, the uncertainty around the interest rates um, and the, the, what we've seen happening um, in terms of policy rates um, across the world and in the US and in Europe in particular has been nothing short of um, uh, really amazing. And that has created an environment where openness to new risk uh, has, been, has been subsided. But having said that, also an interesting point here is that um, uh, the secondary market, i.e. market in new issues of existing companies that are mm. public already, has been actually very, very good, uh, very healthy, very robust. So whether in the form of block trades or whether in the form of uh, just, you know, properly marketed transactions by, by existing issues, um, the market's been actually very, very healthy. Um, thank you, Rakli. Sorry to, 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 to cut you, but uh, we are really short um, uh, in time. And, and, so uh, why don't we skip straight to what we think about this year? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we skip uh, the slide. So um, those pressures, yeah. are they going away or, or uh, staying for, for longer? The pressures uh, that really contain uh, capital markets and, and IPO markets? And, uh, S sorry about uh, well uh, the, the pressures that are affecting uh, IPO markets like interest rates so do you think it will uh, was uh, will stay oh, well, longer well, well, or, or, well, or well, it has gone right um, well I think I think that we, we're coming closer to a view that we, we we're going to see stability mm -hmm. uh, in the policy so um, uh, you know the phrase that has become everybody's um, um, uh, you know, everybody's repeating long, you know, higher for longer. Mm -hmm. It seems to be something that is now uh, become sort of a commonplace view. Um, and with that, uh, I think the openness to the risk is, is, also, is also there. I think a couple of things that I'd like to say here. One is that what, what's been happening to the, to the uh, policy rates has impacted massively cost of capital, right? Mm -hmm. I think we've seen an, an, a very rare and, and pretty, I wouldn't say unprecedented, but a very rare jump in a cost of capital of probably, you know, if you take on average a European company of, let's call it, a, you know, more than 300 basis points. Mm. And that's massive. That's, that's, that, and that obviously impacts the valuation and that impacts the issuers. Um, in terms of, you know, they, do, they think this is way too much and therefore, you know, valuations are not good enough for them. And, uh, and obviously it impacts the, 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 the expectations of investors in terms of valuation, right? Um, so that's been a, been a big, big story of this year. Um, uh, look, uh, we, we are, and we have to be by definition, otherwise what, what are we doing here? Op optimists in terms of the future of capital markets, right? Um, and, and, and IPO markets as well. We see real signs of, um, of uh, activity coming back and investor appetite coming back. Um, this year. Um, is that stable? No, it's not stable. It's still very fragile, um, uh, but, but things are getting done um, and IPOs are getting done.
quality companies. Mm. This is what is, what is what is most important. And here we have a number of very high quality companies. So I'm very much looking forward to um, um, hearing their story. So I said, let me stop here. Well, thank you, Rackley. And um, so you are still very much optimistic about uh, the end of this year and, and coming coming years. We, uh, as we, the we are we are optimistic uh, about like it. stability and yeah. uh, we are yeah. set to rebound. Yeah. Excellent, uh, Mikkel. Uh, just uh, your kind of uh, definition of Baltic capital markets, and, and we've heard the presentation about Icelandic uh, market, and perhaps we may find some similarities and, and uh, relevance to that. Uh, but uh, uh, how you see it? Is it still uh, a good marketplace, really, for the companies to come uh, out and, and uh, raise capital? And, and uh, what's uh, your view on, on what we have in the Baltics now as a capital market? Yeah, thanks and, and hi everyone. It was really refreshing to to see the view on the Icelandic stock exchange, and I think uh, how to say it gives me hope as well <laughs> that we're on the that we're on the uh, right track. Um, there's a long way to go because if if you consider you know Baltics being in in a ballpark of uh, Baltic exchanges uh, having the market cap of around 10% to GDP, um, and you know Nordics are at sort of let's say on average around 100, and Iceland at 60. So there's uh, you know, how we have such a long way to go, and I, I fully agree that um, functional domestic market is a key. It's one of the foundations of the economy, and if this sort of leg doesn't really work, it's, uh, you know, it becomes an issue, uh, because when it comes to foreign listings, I mean, ultimately, the companies are still strangers there. Yes, there's a certain size from, from which it sort of makes sense, but, uh, but I think it's, it's crucial and critical that we just build up the, uh, the market that we have positive is retail, um, Estonia especially, there's a very high and engaged level of retail investors, hope this will pick up in Latvia and Lithuania as well. Um, on the institutional front, it's difficult, uh, it's always a challenge because, let's face it, we're a frontier market as we, as we speak, so we are obviously very thankful always when we have uh, EBRDs and likes uh, together, together with us on transactions. So it's it's a step-by-step -step development, but uh, definitely we, you know, the ambition to grow the market overall by five or six times, I mean, it's, it's huge. But once we get there, it's, uh, uh, it's a very good position to be in. So obviously, I'm very hopeful mm -hmm. that things will improve. Let's spe speculate a bit. How much time do we need really to catch up uh, Iceland, for example? Now, we, we, uh, we are 30 years as we have our stock exchange, right? Mm -hmm. And for uh, Lithuania, just... Um, uh, 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 for you to have an idea, we have like 20 billion deposits sitting of the households sitting in the banks, right? And only 1 billion uh, of uh, euros sitting in a kind of uh, financial instruments. So how to move that capital from uh, deposits in the banks to financial instruments? How much time does it take really for, to change the mindset of, of, of uh, retail investors to keep uh, money not in the safe deposit, but rather into uh, financial instrument and uh, so your speculation and, and now we are 10 percent of GDP and to reach like 30 it's uh, 10 <laughs> yes it's challenge I guess in 2021 it felt it's gonna be three years and now it's gonna be feels like it's gonna be 10 years to 15 yeah. years again it's it's really tough to say but ultimately you know it boils down to the issuers it boils down to the to the fact that companies perceive that being listed is, is something that they want to do and they also understand why is it that they're doing it, what are the sort of next steps, uh, you know, after getting listed on the, on the market. So, but, but you know, it, it's an evolution. We have had now a few more larger companies being listed. Uh, we have increasing number of smaller companies uh, listed as well. And, and, you know, there's a, a group of different issuers sitting on the uh, on my left hand that have, <laughs> that have different stories as well. So really hard to speculate, but but let's assume that the market turns around and the interest rate environment starts to sort of stabilize and and, and work itself out. You know, I hope the pace increases and there's a big uh, influences from on the state-owned companies as well, mm. just to get that ball rolling and basically have this dynamic that uh, that was described regarding the Icelandic stock exchange, you know, how the large companies affect the smaller ones and so on and so forth. It, that's exactly how it works. And this is what we see in the Baltics, right? And uh, we see 
uh, state is giving up uh, control and, and uh, really let uh, like Ignitis to, to, to go public and NF it green and, and uh, uh, so um, it started. We, we, we feel uh, support from the government and understanding. We have like institutional investors like EBRD also supporting. So uh, there is a great uh, level of optimism perhaps that we will be uh, gaining pace in, 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 in uh, setting up our Baltic markets. Yeah. And uh, yes, we, we have like 20 minutes uh, for free issuers, so it's uh, really an elevator pitch uh, for uh, <laughs> each of you. <laughs> and and uh, Yuris, uh, you, you have a big day tomorrow, so you, you are starting subscription uh, process, right? Uh, which will last for one week, so why, why, why Friday 13th? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, good morning, everyone. Yes, uh, I actually get this question quite a lot. Why Friday the 13th? Why such an odd choice of date? Well, the answer is quite simple. Uh, tomorrow is a, is a big day for us for two reasons. Number one is that tomorrow is a World Egg Day and we're in the poultry business. Well, uh, and number two, we're probably going to be the first poultry company ever to go public on a, on a World Egg Day. Mm -hmm. So that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes, bravo. <clears throat> Good luck. But if you could just uh, share with us why IPO, I mean, uh, raising capital for growth, uh, but why IPO? Why not uh, over? Yes, the simple, uh, to put it simply, it is, as you said, we need capital for growth. Uh, we had quite a transformational journey over the last uh, six years. You know, what we took over uh, uh, the beginning of our story was pretty much a abundant Soviet era infrastructure which over six years we turned into, uh, I would say, the most modern poultry farm in this part of Europe. And today we are uh, third largest egg producer uh, in the Baltics in terms of production output and also in terms of revenue. So for now, uh, for, for us, it's, uh, it is a growth story indeed. Uh, and, uh, you know, to, to, to comment on, you know, why IPO as opposed to, to other uh, financial instruments, uh, the answer to that one is, uh, is you know, our, um, our strategy or, or our desire to, to grow fast, right? The investment program that we have uh, put in place now, we could do it ourselves. Uh, we could do it ourselves using our own cash flow and using bank loans, uh, but then it would take three to four years. But we want to do it within one year. And why we want to do it within one year? Because we want to take advantage of the very important uh, structural shifts and shifts in consumer behavior that are happening as we speak in our industry. Mm. And uh, as you said, it will be a first uh, Latvian IPO this year, right? Why now? I mean, uh, do you feel that uh, the market is ready and uh, conditions are right? And uh... Well, I was told by one seasoned uh, IPO who done three IPOs that, you know, there is never a good time for IPO. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more of a question when you believe you are ready as a, as a business owner, uh, when you believe your company is ready to go public, because I guess uh, the way we look at it, in some way it's an exam, sort of basically you go out public, you, you dress down if you like, right? You mm. basically let anyone to look at what you've done over the years, um, you, uh, evaluate your company, so it's kind of a political campaign if you like, you're campaigning for investors' money. Yeah, okay. Well, since you have a uh, potential 350 uh, investors sitting in this hall, so uh, what's uh, your kind of uh, price offer? How do you uh, just uh, tell me about the evaluation uh, process and how do you value your company and uh, why? The, uh, uh, well, the prospectus is obviously out because we're starting tomorrow. The, uh, the price per share is, uh, is set uh, at the level just below seven euros. And the reason we do that uh, is because, you know, we want it uh, to be uh, accessible and, you know, available to a very wide uh, retail base as well. You know, we're in a fast uh, movable consumer goods market. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a very uh, known uh, brand here in Latvia and also in the Baltics because for us, Baltics is a, a domestic market. So we really, you know, want to have a very wide uh, investor base and, and have lots of retail investors too. Uh, in terms of valuation, well, uh, luckily, you know, uh, there is a third party uh, research paper out, uh, which kind of hints that we are in fact uh, leaving some money on the table uh, if, if we compare it to our company to, to, the, uh, to the peers, which I think is a, is a good news for, uh, for our uh, investors that, you know, there is some upside uh, to be made. Yeah. 
Well, indeed, I, I, I've read the same research, and it says that uh, the offer is uh, with some 30% discount to fair uh, market value. So it's really a Black Friday tomorrow. <laughs> it is indeed. It yeah. is indeed. Well, good luck. Good luck, and, and um, yeah, we would like to see uh, your uh, offering successful and, and uh, putting a pace or opening doors and, and uh, serving as an example or encouragement to our issuers. And uh, Marty, uh, perhaps there is a reason why you are uh, sitting on this panel, isn't it? <coughs> so. Thanks, uh, <laughs> and good morning to everyone uh, from my side as well. Yes, there is a reason. Um, we dis discussed that yesterday evening that, that I'm literally speaking in the timeline in between Yuri's and Poles. <laughs> so, so uh, Infortar um, has grown into one of the largest investment companies in the Baltics. So, so uh, we feel that, that it's, it's the right time to also um, prepare ourselves for, uh, for becoming public. So, so actually we have done already quite a bit of work. So it's, it's too early to say uh, when and what and numbers and things like that. But, but uh, I must admit, we have done quite a bit of job. Um, and from our point of view, I think the, the, the main reason why we have been thinking about is that, that um, during those 26 years, what we have been operating, the company has grown um, into becoming quite big. And, and the thing is that we are from Estonia. Estonia is a small country, and I think in Estonia nowadays we are a very much a household name, so, so I think people know who Infortar is. But, but right now our growth is a lot about going international. So um, our recent largest transaction was uh, acquiring Caso in Latvia, so we closed that uh, about three months ago. So, uh, so I think at that point of time many people in Latvia thought that, you know, what? What, what is this Infortar about? So, so I think that one of the, one of the greatest things we, we want to get from, from being listed is um, the recognition, mm. the visibility that people know what we are. Um, also, I think the, the transparency and the quality mark is very important because, you know, Infortar is, is active in, in three bi different business segments. So I think that, that our shipping part, the telling, is pretty much well known to, to people in the region. We are also active in uh, real estate. We have quite a big portfolio of, of high quality asset in, assets in Tallinn. But I think that, that, you know, when we look at the largest growing part of the business, which, which is energy. So yeah. this is what people don't know maybe so much. You know, we sold 1 billion euros of, of energy last year. And, and I think that, that it, it wasn't then one of. So, and, and actually we're always looking for the growth. So, but the growth is outside of Estonia and it, it's actually outside of the Baltics as mm -hmm. well. So that's why, you know, when we will be listed, it, it actually gives transparency for our partners, for our customers in, in other markets as well. Because, you know, if you say that, that you, we are a privately owned company from Estonia, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But when you're a Nasdaq listed company from, from, the, from the Baltics, then it's another thing. And of course, I think that, that you know, the platform we have built up is, is a very strong, it's a good one. We can, you know, use the current market situation, which gives lots of opportunities and, and um, having stronger liquidity position and more gunpowder gun mm. definitely helps. Very interesting. So uh, if uh, APF is, is uh, set to raise capital and, and uh, for to finance its growth, so you are looking for recognition or, or uh, being recognized as a transparent and, and reliable partner with your uh, foreign ventures. Is that... The, the consideration or capital raising uh, as well? Almost. I think that, that you know, we, we don't underestimate mm -hmm. the value being listed because, you know, when, when we, uh, you know, we, we, we are a large company mm -hmm. in, in local terms, but we still are very agile. Mm -hmm. Meaning that, that, you know, this causal transaction was an example where we, I think we were the last one to enter the process and we were the ones who delivered. So, so um, that means that, that, you know, although liquidity is always a key element of our business, so, so we have to be liquid, but, but, you know, when you have opportunities and you're lacking capital, then being listed definitely helps you to attract more. And, and that's why, you know, we have the luxury that, that um, in, 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 in uh, current situation, we have the luxury with, to, to play with the amount of, of the capital raising. So, so it's rather we want to be listed 
and we are not maybe kind of so much thinking that is the timing right or, or things yeah. like that. Of course, you can have some black swan events and then you, 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 you need to postpone that. But in general, you know, we strongly believe that, you know, the markets are right. We want to do our um, um, uh, issue, you know, when we are ready and hopefully soon. And that uh, leads to thinking that you may be considering dual listing perhaps, right? If you want recognition, so uh, no, it's is, uh, Nasdaq Baltic sufficient stamp of quality, so to say. No, we, uh, our um, uh, shipping investment mm. telling um, is listed both in Tallinn and Helsinki. So we have some, some experience, experience with those topics. Um, but I think in, 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 in the first um, um, stage, I think definitely we look at the Tallinn only because, you know, this is, this is where we are headquartered. This is where we are most recognized. And I think that, that uh, you know, Nasdaq Tallinn is a good place to, to be listed. So maybe in the future, when we grow bigger, when we have more presence in other markets in Central Europe, then, then that might make sense. But I think it's right now too early. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marty. So good luck. And, and we uh, look forward to, to kind of uh, seeing in Fortara on, on, on uh, the exchange very soon. Thank you. Excellent company. And uh, that would be a perfect addition to our markets, uh, I believe. And uh, Pulse, it's a public secret, right? Uh, that uh, the advisors are lined up and, and uh, companies preparing for uh, IPO. So uh, there is a talk uh, when uh, next year, uh, spring or autumn. So if you could just uh, explain us um, a bit about the uh, rationale of, of, of uh, this attempt and, and what you are trying to achieve really with uh, this public offering. Sure. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's very appropriate, I think, that we're here as our Baltic and uh, at the Baltic Capital Markets Conference. Um, we have an ambition and uh, we have together, uh, I think, a joint vision of where we should be going. And you as the conference uh, participants uh, we are the players uh, in, in, this, in this field. And uh, we are the, you know, the issuer that will be interacting with you and uh, looking to work with you and, and have your support. Irma, as you said uh, you know, earlier that you, know, you had your 20 years and you're looking for the new chapter. And for sure, uh, we plan and intend to be uh, writing, being part of that new chapter uh, of the capital markets. Uh, you all heard this morning the uh, Minister Karinj uh, giving his presentation, talking about you know, his vision and the, 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 the political vision of, of moving things forward. And uh, you know, it's, it's something that doesn't happen overnight. He's been working many years on it. And, uh, now he feels that they're now getting into, uh, into, into a situation where it's uh, coming forward, uh, coming abreast. And, and this is this new chapter that, uh, that you're talking about. And for us, it's a story about timing as well. Uh, our company has 28 years of, uh, of history, and that 28 years goes along exactly with all the, the Baltic states and uh, the development uh, internally, economically of, uh, of these countries, of the markets. And, uh, that timing now has you know, a confluence from uh, numerous directions that uh, shows that this is, you know, this is the direction and this is the time to, uh, to go forward with it. Uh, you said, okay, it's uh, never a good time. Uh, you know, I, I would take the glasses half full, uh, look at it that it is a good time, uh, you know, given that, the, you know, that these factors are coming together. Uh, for us, uh, as an airline, the, the road has been bumpy, uh, it's always uh, exposed to all the geopolitical risks, you know, just uh, the last weeks also show that. Uh, but fundamentally, all the steps that have been taken over the years and, you know, starting from the restructuring that happened uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, finally, the company is in a position that uh, the strategy is in place and it's working and it's already sh now showing that it's working and uh, coming with the results. Uh, we had our first, uh, the best first half year results uh, in 2023 that, uh, that we released. And with all these things happening, this then brings us to the position that we feel that this is, uh, you know, the right time to go into the preparation. Um, there has not been a European airline IPO since uh, 2015. Uh, the last airline to do it was Wizz. There are a few that are positioning right now, and uh, 
were among uh, those. And I think, you know, that's the European context and, you know, one of the things that makes us a bit uh, special compared to uh, some other players in the Baltics is that we're also uh, very much uh, focused and commercially uh, working within not just uh, the Baltic areas, but uh, uh, within Europe. And so, you know, our ambition is not only, you know, as Latvia, as the Baltics, but also we, to take our place uh, within Europe. But even more importantly, uh, it, within the preparation, you know, we, we have hired our uh, financial advisors, STJ mm -hmm. and Superia are on board and, and, and things are really uh, being act, are active now and uh, we're moving very well ahead. But w what we have, have said and what is clear is that the listing will be uh, in, in Riga. Uh, it will be Nasdaq uh, Riga. And this is really important, uh, as it was mentioned, that we, we have a joint market. We have the Baltics uh, as, a, as, a, as a joint uh, area because Air Baltic is ideally situated in terms of its market presence, its rec recognizability and its economic impact, uh, not just locally Latvia, but uh, within these Baltic markets. And, uh, you know, coming in, you know, into this, uh, into this listing is very important, both for us as a company, but also I think, you know, uh, to strengthen the, uh, the capital markets. We saw that chart, you know, I almost fell off my chair when I saw, you know, Latvia 2% uh, uh, of uh, market cap to GDP and, you know, we have to do something about that. It's uh, imperative. And, uh, you know, with our size, with, uh, with our recognizability and, you know, the timing that things are really coming together, there is support and also your support, uh, you know, we feel we can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. And market momentum. So we, we, we hear that uh, in the aviation industry in Europe, there, there is uh, restructuring going on and uh, SAS is also uh, having new uh, shareholders now and uh, Air France, KLM, uh, we are buying in. So do you see this uh, market is uh, kind of uh, becoming more stringent and, and uh, hostile to you? And uh, do you need to expand, expand or die? Is it? Uh... <laughs> so the uh, uh, airline, European airline uh, industry is very competitive and it's very uh, exposed and, and, and changes happen. And, you know, we see, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, just in the region, a number of big, big news of the day happening. But uh, Air Baltic over these years has been able to uh, find its place, develop a unique business model. And as I said previously, you know, one that is showing that it's working. And, uh, you know, we have been able to increase our market share in our home market in the Baltics. Uh, we we uh, are strong against our competition who are very big players and very strong. So, you know, we're able to find our way to do it. Um, and uh, with the, our planned IPO, part of it, of course, is the growth story. Uh, we're currently almost complete with 50 aircraft uh, in our fleet. Our business plan going through 2030 uh, takes the fleet to a 100. So we're okay. planning to go to up double. to 100, so doubling our, our size. and not only you know, with that kind of size, it's not just a Baltic uh, company. This is a, then a very uh, strong and, and large company within the context of Europe. Well, thank you. And perhaps and most likely it will be double uh, or dual listing right? Uh, for uh, Air Baltic. So, you know, I, I cannot imagine. It's, it's uh, uh, been only a few weeks since we officially have the uh, advisors on board. Uh, you know, there's really a lot of work that, and preparation and analysis that's, that's, that's in play right now. Uh, and for sure, uh, the question about listing, dual listing, uh, you know, the pros and the cons, uh, you know, as we've already heard, um, you know, is something that's on the table and will be uh, developed further. So uh, to be continued. Well, and process, yes. Well, thank you very much. And Air Baltic, that would be really a big, big uh, thing for, for our markets. And uh, again, that would be a push uh, for further development. And I'm so happy that we have like uh, three issuers out of uh, five panelists, not like uh, five advisors and no issuers. So uh, <laughs> that uh, shows and speaks for itself. So um, uh, our time is over and now I'm just trying to figure out uh, what questions do we have from uh, the audience, but my device is not showing any questions, so it's uh, only for previous speaker. Is it so? Do we have a question? I, I have a question. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Um, um, exactly. Paul, I, I noted uh, in the introduction, it says you're a pilot, you're ex-pilot. And I remember a long time ago, I was talking to a colleague of mine discussing, you know, yet another crisis in the sector in the US this time. And, and he was an American banker and he said, listen, Iraqi, one thing you need to know about, you know, air companies is that they're all run by pilots <laughs> and the pilots love to buy new planes. <laughs> That's all they care about. Um, what he actually meant is that they're, they love to buy new equipment, yeah. they don't care about the discipline. We obviously have witnessed a complete refurbishment of your fleet, which by the way is amazing. Um, but, but what do you say to this um, as a former pilot and now a CEO? Uh, or, or the, sorry, the management, you know, the top of the management of the company, yeah, CEO. So, uh, out, out of three board members. Is that still true? Is that so, still two true? out of three are pilots, so it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we have a, a very strong direction for sure. Uh, I mean, uh, that maybe was was the case in years gone by, but uh, for sure, I mean, it's it's all about uh, you know, it's an investment, it's capital, and and, and it has to uh, return that investment, and you have to find the right tool to do it. And for sure, our fleet, our aircraft is is the tool. It is the most modern. It's the uh, has the lowest uh, trip cost for that size of aircraft. You know, there was this, the the discussion about ESG and so on. All airlines are trying to transition to more uh, economical, more uh, lower emission type of aircraft. Our fleet is entirely the state of the art, the top of the class. So, I mean, we're there already, and that's you know one of the, the primary stories that, that we'll be telling during our IPO is that you know that, that we have the right equipment, and we have the know-how, we have the experience to uh, to to make it work. So now I, I found questions. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> A series of them, not on the top, but on the bottom. So uh, question to Infortar. Why do you expect that Infortar will be a better listing than Tiling? Why? Sorry, could you repeat? Uh, why do you think or do you expect that Infortar will be a better listing than Tiling? I think that um, those, those companies are, you know, similar but different. I think the, the, the great value around Infortar is that, that since the very beginning, um, kind of the vision of, of our owners has been to, to, to create a company which is like crisis proof. And being crisis proof means that, that, you know, you have to invest into kind of diversified businesses. So when we look at our portfolio, then, then with what we have there are, are, you know, three different business segments, which are having different cyclicalities and different seasonalities. Like we were joking that once when we invested into the gas business, then, then you know, before that, during the winter time, Tallink was doing like it was a low season for Tallink. But now after, you know, when it's cold outside, it's good for our business because people are, are using more gas. But, but, um, um, but at the same time, you know, the, the, the businesses we have invested into are kind of similar as well. Mm. They're all like, you know, capital intensive. They're like traditional in a good way. You know, you, you have a strong cash flow. You have high barriers of entry. And when you have this, this mix together, then, um, then you know, in, 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 in old times, you know, when you didn't have shocks, then, then, you know, stable businesses were doing pretty stably all through the business cycles. But, but over the past three, four years, we have seen, you know, major events happening. So, you know, firstly, COVID, you know, if, 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 if Infortar would have been owning only Tallink back in 2020, I think it would have, would have, would have been a great challenge. I think Paul remembers what, what happened then, you know, we had 1 billion euros of sales and suddenly you have zero sales. So it's more diversity. Yeah, it's more like diversification yeah. and then at the same time, the energy was doing great. So, so kind of the philosophy is that, that um, you know, when you have eggs in different baskets, then eggs in different <laughs> baskets. Yeah, so speaking of eggs, uh, sorry to interrupt, but a uh, uh, question to uh, Yuris. And um, can you shortly describe the ESG direction of the company? I mean, the ESG, which is uh, really a big, big, big uh, thing and uh, to follow and to comply sure. with. So it's, uh, sure, is it absolutely. a challenge or? Uh, no, well, I guess it is a challenge for the industry and to real sector at large, but I think we are very well placed. Uh, in fact, we, we do take ESG matters very seriously. And I was actually quite surprised. We, uh, the last two days we had a roadshow in, uh, in Estonia and we met with, uh, with few investors. And uh, I was actually, 
positively sort of uh, surprised that you know the sustainability and EG matters are becoming of, of more and more um, relevance. So what we did actually more than two years ago, we took a very conscious decision that we would implement a zero waste mentality in our production processes. So we did that two years ago. Uh, as we speak, we are completing installation of uh, solar panel uh, park. So uh, uh, we'll produce most of electricity for our needs uh, on our own. Uh, we do take actually a great care in animal welfare questions. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, today we are the largest uh, cage-free egg producer in the Baltics. And that's actually the storyline that we tell to our investors that, you know, one of the key premises uh, uh, of our investment story is the transformation to the completely cage uh, rearing facility. And it's no secret as a consumer, as most of you know it, uh, by year 2025, you know, all of the major retailers have announced that the cage reared eggs will be no longer sold on the shelves. And we're going to that direction. So uh, I think even our starting position is, is very strong to, in that regard. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, I would like to, to thank to all panelists uh, for, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. And I, I hope you enjoy the discussion. And, and uh, questions, please save for uh, coffee breaks and, and lunch. And you can approach um, each of us and, and uh, continue the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you.